Well, good morning, and I'm, I'm really delighted to welcome Rich Adler to our uh, meeting this morning. Rich is a, a software architect uh, who has been involved with uh, essentially the de de decision making process, both from the point of view of business decisions and policy uh, decisions, as in the sense of uh, homeland security and other such uh, activities. And I'm just delighted, Rich, that you are joining us today uh, to talk about uh, the, essentially uh, uh, violating, or if that's the right word, the law of unintended consequences by being smart about it in decision making. Uh, Rich has a BS in physics and philosophy from the University of Michigan. He's a master's degree from the University of Illinois at uh, uh, Urbana, and a PhD in physics from uh, the University of Minnesota. Now that is a big pen pedigree. I gotta say that's impressive, Rich. I, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a Buckeye and a Nittany Lion, so I, I, I sort of resemble that experience. But yeah. welcome to the Wilson Forum, and uh, Rich, the floor is yours. Thank you, thanks, Ron. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, good morning, everyone. And I, I have to make one correction. It's actually uh, PhDs in philosophy of physics, so I'm a doctor of philosophy of philosophy. Oh, but that's a topic for another time. Okay, okay. All right, so I'll get started. We have a lot of material to cover. Um, in 2020, I published a book entitled Bending the Law of Unintended Consequence. This presentation provides an overview of the book's central themes. Uh, is this, there we go. My talk will address, uh, are you seeing the second slide? Yeah. Okay, great. My talk will address three topics. First, what are critical decisions and why do they go awry so frequently? Second, how can you improve critical decisions and their outcomes? And I call my answer to this important question, the decision test drive method. And then third, I'll actually illustrate the test drive method in practice with a case study. And I'll focus on decisions about managing risk, a major problem that vexes business and government enterprise alike. You can think of these three segments as diagnosis, treatment, and praxis. Decision makers tend to downplay or ignore diagnosis out of the desire to act quickly. But suppose that you're a physician who misdiagnoses a patient's symptoms. Then the treatment you prescribe will probably not cure their actual underlying condition. Decision making is similar. If you don't understand why critical decisions turn out badly, it's very difficult to improve outcomes. To give you some context, my approach to decision-making draws from several fields, including cognitive psychology, economics, sociology, and management theory. The key breakthrough is the idea of a decision test drive, which combines scenario planning with dynamic modeling and simulation techniques, plus a pinch of AI and knowledge management thrown in. Dogs like this contemplative dachshund live in the moment. Their decisions are short-term, and narrowly bounded in scope. My book focuses on what I call critical decisions, which pose entirely different challenges. Critical decisions are made by organizations, such as businesses, government agencies, nonprofits, and other institutions. They focus on enterprise scale strategic or operational issues. Examples of critical decisions made by businesses include uh, what kind of goods and services to produce, who to market to and sell them to, and how. Uh, mergers and acquisitions, divestitures, going public, financing, uh, things like downsizing, restructuring business units, hiring, compensating, and succession planning of executives, and switching out core processes, enter enterprise IT systems or technology platforms. You know, huh? In addition to dealing with these organization-centric challenges, government leaders and managers uh, have to deal with uh, critical decisions to assure the well-being and security of their societies. Common examples of de decision train wrecks are legion. Entrepreneurs building B2B net markets pursued a disruptive business model that exploited the internet to rework industrial supply chains. Over a thousand net markets sprouted during the dot-com boom. Virtually none of them survived the dot-com crash in 2001, done in by over-optimism, overconfidence, 
and a misreading of industry dynamics. M&A transactions have a notoriously high failure rate, seriously overpromising and underdelivering results. AOL Time Warner is a poster child for M&A train wrecks, producing um, a loss, a staggering loss of 200 plus billion dollars in shareholder value. This decision in 2000 was a perfect storm of bad analysis, bad timing, and bad execution, including a major failure to manage cultural change. Early retirement programs shrink workforces. This is a downsizing strategy that's very popular in tough economic times because it incentivizes workers to leave voluntarily. However, in practice, EROs are deceptively hard to design and execute. For example, DuPont carried out a notable uh, ERO in the mid 1980s to cut costs in a stagnant economy. But their program was oversubscribed by fully 100%, which doubled costs over their plan. And to add insult to injury, the ERO produced a serious drain of expert knowledge that impacted operations and proved difficult and very expensive to correct. So in, in short, critical decisions fail because they're deeply flawed at inception or go off the rails as they're being executed. Decision debacles such as failed M&As occur with some regularity and they're very well documented. And yet even leaders with successful track records continue to make critical decisions that run aground. So why does this happen and what can be done to fix the problem? Well, let's start with saying what makes a decision critical? I propose four criteria. They entail significant risk. If you screw them up, they'll likely damage, cripple, or kill your business and likely harm your career. They also impact diverse stakeholders, including customers, investors, employees, and competitors. We often have limited knowledge about the agenda and behavior of these parties. They play out over years or even decades. Consider, for example, decisions to develop drugs or energy assets. And their impacts extend beyond organizational boundaries into markets or the economy at large. So what are the implications of these factors? Why do they make decisions so hard? Well, to start, they give rise to complicated objectives with multiple metrics that often conflict. So that requires hard trade-offs. They feature many moving parts. This makes allocating resources and choreographing schedules of interdependent activities to implement decisions very complicated. But doing nothing is not a safe fallback or default. Consider, for example, the shareholder losses following Yahoo's decision to reject Microsoft's takeover offer in 2008. They're not amenable to standard analytical tools, including operations research and the current silver bullets of big data, predictive analytics, and machine learning. The simplifying assumptions required to use these tools on critical decisions renders results patently unrealistic. And to add insult to injury, critical decisions occur with relatively low frequency, which makes it hard for most organizations to build and maintain internal expertise. The test drive method was designed expressly for critical decisions. However, you can often apply the ideas underlying the test drive method to non-critical decisions, such as personal life choices and routine operational decisions. So there are two schools of thought today as to why critical decisions go awry so often. Psychologists and many management consultants point to biases in our thought processes. These are produced by emotions, feelings, values, and intuitions that distort our judgments and choices. The famous gut instincts that leaders take such pride in are saturated with cognitive biases. By contrast, decision scientists gravitate towards bounded rationality as the explanation. They assert that human beings simply lack the cognitive horsepower to formulate or select alternatives that are optimal, at least in the complex environments that typify critical decisions. I believe that both views are flawed because they're incomplete and siloed. The answer is not one or the other theory, but a combination of the two. Greek mythology offers a good analogy. Homer's epic, The Odyssey, describes a narrow strait dominated by um, two monsters, Scylla, a multi-headed serpent, and Charybdis, a horrific whirlpool. 
Odysseus was forced to sail through this strait to return home. Critical decision makers face a similar dilemma, surviving dual lethal menaces of biases and cognitive rationality. Incidentally, uh, this story is the origin for the expression caught between a rock and a hard place. In my book, I argue that critical decisions go awry because of the law of unintended consequences, stated here. Robert K. Merton, a prominent American sociologist, christened the law back in 1936 and provided the first formal analysis of its causes. He identified five causal factors that would be recognized now as cognitive biases and bounds of rationality. Merton was the first to understand that if you ignore either cluster of factors, you'll provoke the law. Equally important, Merton's causal diagnosis points the way to defend against the law and improve critical decisions, as I'll discuss shortly. Unfortunately, Merton was a, decades ahead of his time and his ideas did not catch on widely. So my book attempts to revive and extend Merton's seminal work. Theory of cognitive biases was developed by psychologists Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman starting in the late 1960s. Biases stem from the intuitions that allow us to respond to everyday situations quickly and with minimal data. But these shortcuts tend to be unreliable and misleading in complex situations. Psychologists have identified over 180 distinct biases they can be grouped into six broad categories. Pattern recognition biases affect the way we gather and interpret data, such as seeing patterns or stories where none exist and the well-known confirmation bias. Action biases incline us to cut corners in making decisions and act precipitously or over-aggressively. Over-optimism is an example. Stability biases uh, dispose us to delay or refrain from action out of inertia or fear such as aversion to loss. Interest biases tend to uh, lead us to make decisions that favor ourselves or our teams over the greater good, while social biases stem from group-based dynamics, such as a desire to avoid conflict in meetings. Finally, dynamic biases stem from deficiencies in our cognitive capabilities to understand causal relationships and predict change over time. So this includes things like feedback loops. Herbert Simon, an economist, among other things, first identified the causes of bounded rationality in the 1950s. They include these factors, uh, our inability to collect complete data about our current situation, our imperfect social scientific knowledge for predicting how situations will evolve, the inherent complexity of markets and other social contexts, uncertainty about the future, human error, and the pragmatic problem of we generally don't have enough time or budget to do a really good job making decisions. One last piece remains to complete the diagnostic puzzle of why critical decisions go awry so often. We tend to think of decisions as discrete events, which are often dramatic and stressful, but decisions are actually processes that extend over time. The activities leading up to the unjustly celebrated point of decision are no less crucial than the choice itself. They're like prep work and home projects, such as painting or tiling. If you're sloppy or careless, the job won't hold up. Skillful execution is just as important as diligent preparation because your environment continues to evolve while you implement a decision. These changes can invalidate your original assumptions and trigger unintended outcomes. To avoid this, you must monitor both the performance of your decision and situational changes and be prepared to adjust your decision to ensure successful outcomes. So we're now in a position to answer the question of why the law of unintended consequences is so deadly and pervasive. Its diverse causes impact all the various steps of the critical decision-making process, and their effects are all different. The train wrecks described earlier and many more ill-fated critical decisions all trace back to unintended consequences caused by biases, and reasoning constraints that arise when we confront choices in complex situations. In short, if you don't approach both classes of threats systematically, you're likely to have a close encounter of the nasty kind with the law. This brings us to the second part of my talk or treatment. The law of unintended consequences is implacable and congenital. It's part of the human condition and you can't really avoid or break it. 
You can, however, reduce the frequency and severity of its effects, effectively bending the law. This requires some effort and a coordinated campaign on two fronts. First, you must defend against cognitive biases. The key here is to override wayward intuitions through deliberate disciplined thinking. But this is, isn't sufficient. You can compensate for biases until the cows come home. Simply defending against poor judgments and choices doesn't ensure great outcomes. It merely reduces the likelihood of avoidably bad ones. To bend the law, you must go on the offensive and actually improve the decision. The second front is a tougher nut to crack. Bounded rationality precludes predicting the future reliably. So we have to focus instead on the more modest objectives of anticipating plausible futures and exploring the possible consequences of decision options in those futures. This is the crux of the test drive method in bending the law. Better anticipation means fewer unintended consequences because it exposes possible threats early, enabling you to take steps to avoid or mitigate them. Anticipation can be improved by leverage, leveraging decision sciences and computers, specifically modeling and simulation software tools that incorporate what-if scenarios, enhance and scale deliberate thinking about critical decisions beyond what we can do with our little doggy brains alone. So, debiasing is a recent buzzword that refers to techniques for overcoming cognitive biases such as misleading intuitions. For example, you can compensate for action biases through an exercise called pre-mortems. A pre-mortem starts by assuming that your sure thing decision has somehow gone horribly wrong. Now imagine what could have caused such a train wreck, such as faulty assumptions, unexpected events, or execution errors. So in effect, pre-mortems sober you up from action biases, such as overconfidence, overoptimism, neglecting contingency, and discounting your competitors. Time doesn't, review, doesn't permit a review of the debiasing techniques recommended to counter all the biases. So instead, I'll just make a few observations. First, don't attempt to defend against individual biases, particularly on an ad hoc basis. There are just too many. They're like the mythical harpies or furies. So instead, combat them as categories, the six groups I talked about before. This works because biases in each category tend to be amenable to similar techniques. Leverage the power of work teams. It turns out that different people have different susceptibilities to each bias. So use work teams to trap and defend against each other's vulnerabilities. Third, treat biases as a quality control problem. Industrial machines perform with small variations inevitably that introduce defects into production processes. What quality control does is focus us on improving individual process steps to minimize the variations that reduce overall yield. So in our context, think of people as the machines and biases as the sources of defects in judgments and choices. To defend against cognitive biases systematically, you must harden your decision-making process as a whole by integrating relevant debiasing techniques such as pre-mortems into each process step. Now, dynamic biases are relatively neglected in the literature, and they're generally less susceptible to debiasing techniques. So defending against them requires powerful tools, such as the simulations built into our test drive method. The second front of the campaign to bend the law, recall, requires going on the offensive against bounded rationality. This is where decision, decision test drives enter the picture. So consumers test drive cars or trucks to experience firsthand their handling, power, comfort, and visibility prior to buying them. Granted, road tests are imperfect predictors. The actual vehicle you buy may have defects or it might age badly. Nevertheless, test drives offer a quick, simple means to reduce the risk of mistake and disappointment for costly purchases. Decision test drives play an analogous role for critical decisions. Instead of cars, you test out multiple decision options, and you test them against plausible futures rather than performing driving maneuvers on different kinds of roads. Diversity is crucial because the law rears its ugly head when you bet on decisions that are brittle. That is, their success depends on a specific future coming to pass. 
As I said, predicting the future correctly is virtually impossible. However, conceiving a range of plausible futures is eminently feasible and anticipating how alternative decisions might play out in those futures reduces the risk of collisions with the law. In addition, comparing projected outcomes highlights the relevant, rel relative strengths and weaknesses of competing alternatives. So this allows you to improve promising options by eliminating underperforming decision elements and adding attractive components borrowed from other alternatives. Part of the assault on bounded rationality is to improve anticipation of decision outcomes. The central question is, uh, what will happen if we do X and the world evolves along path Y? To be effective, decision test drives must account for three distinct types of dynamics. First, what processes is your organization currently carrying out and what new actions will it have to undertake to execute your critical decision? Second, how might conditions evolve while you are implementing your decision? The usual suspects here include disruptive events, uh, tr uh, such as new market entrants, trends such as the rate of market growth, and forces such as increased access to new technology. Third, what are other decision stakeholders currently doing and how might they respond to situational changes? This inc includes competitors' reactions to your prospective decisions. So projecting decision outcomes is analogous to plotting a boat's course across a lake. Sailors can't just aim straight at their desired target point on the opposite shore. Instead, their navigation plan must account for the prevailing winds and currents. This is similar for critical decisions. You must consider what might happen while you execute a candidate decision, not just the anticipated end state. Anticipating the details of situational dynamics is particularly important when they act non-linearly over time or when the future diverges from the past, for example, due to disruptive changes in technology. So how do you actually test drive a critical decision? Fasten your seatbelts. So we start with a baseline description of your current situation, including your environment, your current state, and other parties of interest. The baseline must also um, incorporate metrics that allow projected outcomes of decision options to be compared. Next, copy that baseline scenario and extend each such copy with the what if assumptions about the market, social and government influences that will define a distinct plausible future. Now is the time to define your set of alternative decision options in sufficient detail to allow simulating their execution. The primary task here is to create a schedule for the activities that need to be performed for implementation, along with estimates of how each such activity will move the dial on your performance metrics. Okay, copy each of the plausible futures, inserting one of these alternate decisions into each. So this is basically an exercise of combinatorics. I call the resulting models dynamic scenarios. Each such model uh, amounts to a script for a movie of one decision option in one plausible future. Project their outcomes and compare. Finally, we apply a rule to select the best decision. The goal is to identify a decision option that produces the most attractive outcomes across a broad range of plausible futures. In this case, it's number B, while avoiding any train wrecks. This decision will be likely be suboptimal in formal economics terms. However, it will be robust in the face of uncertainty and thereby minimize exposure to the law. This is a crucial point. Robustness is the primary goal of the decision test drive method. Competing techniques seek to identify the best performing decision, assuming the most likely future obtains. By contrast, the test drive method works to find a decision that outperforms competitors across diverse futures while avoiding or mitigating what could possibly go wrong. I believe that this decision support method and tools are unique. By now, I've probably triggered your flight instinct, but the mechanics of test driving critical decisions isn't nearly as intimidating as they sound, so don't panic. The process is actually very similar to working with spreadsheets. 
Other companies or people do the heavy lifting of building the spreadsheet engine and developing worksheets to model the task at hand. The job of end users is confined to populating the input cell in the worksheet with their data, performing some what ifs and analyzing and comparing options. Analogously, the infrastructure for decision test drive consists of a pre-existing software platform and templates for dynamic scenarios. The platform I built consists of a modeling framework and user interface, a simulation engine, and analytical tools. I create test drive templates in collaboration with expert decision makers. They're like worksheets on steroids. A template provides a best practices skeleton for test driving one type of critical decision. It specifies the minimal required data inputs, the key performance metrics to track, the elements for formulating a competent decision option in that domain, and relevant situational dynamics. So for this apparatus, end users are typically mid-level analysts or consultants. They should be competent in the decision domain, but they need not be experts. The knowledge embedded in the dynamic scenario templates insulates these end users against diverse biases, such as relate collecting data and making assumptions. The key point here is that the test drive method is agnostic with respect to decision domains. If a decision satisfies our conditions for criticality, it's generally worthwhile and feasible to test drive. My book describes example test drives for four types of critical decisions shown here. I'll describe the risk management test drive shortly. Recall that the uh, execution phase of the decision-making process is a tempting target for the law in its own right. So you must defend against the law's ravages after the point of decision to ensure success. I call this the early warning system mode because by the time you get to execution, you already own your decision. It's too late to test drive it again. So here's a basic idea. You've made your decision. Suppose you're now several months into executing it. What you need to do is update your original dynamic scenarios to reflect your current situation. So this involves throwing out scenarios that no longer seem plausible and adding new scenarios to reflect your current uncertainties about the future. You must also revise them to reflect the fact that some of your scheduled decision actions have already been completed and produced results. Now you rerun the simulator on this updated set of dynamic scenarios for your chosen decision. If the projected outcomes are all favorable, you can relax and take a nap. If not, then you need to diagnose the shortfalls to identify their causes and adjust your decision to mitigate or avoid these impending threats. Repeat this process periodically or when any disruptive events occur. So conducting test drives plus using this early warning system supports decision makers across the entire decision life cycle, not just the point of decision. So we've, we've come to my third and last topic, what a decision test drive looks like in practice. I'll use critical decisions for managing organizational and societal risks for our example. I'll start by explaining our general approach to dynamic modeling of risk, and then review the details of a specific risk decision test drive. Risk can be defined as a potential for undesirable outcomes, including financial losses, injury or death, and damage to property or reputation. Enterprise risk management, or ERM, is a branch of decision science that seeks to minimize exposure to risks through two closely coupled activities. First, risk analysis identifies and assesses threats that generate risks. What causes threats? That is, what conditions or event sequences are required to generate a threat and how does it cause harm? For example, Cyber threats are carried out through various attack modes, such as ransomware, phishing, and denial of service. These modes gain attackers access to websites or computer networks, where they can steal data or compromise operations in various ways. Analysis also quantifies potential risk losses, typically in monetary terms. So risk is estimated most commonly as the likelihood of occurrence of a threat multiplied by the estimated magnitude of expected harm or losses, denominated in dollars. The second core activity in ERM, risk management, prescribes policies and allocates resources to prevent, mitigate, or recover from harm. 
Note that effective management presupposes a thorough analysis of risk. Resources are almost never sufficient to address all salient organizational or societal risks. By quantifying them, analysis allows risks to be compared and prioritized. This facilitates the assignment of scarce resources to where they'll provide the most benefit. And understanding how threats arise and cause losses is similarly vital to developing measures to avoid them or mitigate and recover from their effects. Our approach to modeling ERM decisions leverages portfolio theory, a technique introduced by economist Harry Markowitz in 1952 for managing ROI, mar or return on investment for a diversified set of financial products. Markowitz considered a set of asset classes such as stocks and bonds, their expected rates of return over time, and their variances. He used variance, which is simply the range of variation in prices historically, as a statistical proxy for the volatility or risk in asset values. Given these inputs, Markowitz identified a set of efficient portfolios, which is simply allocations of assets that maximize ROI relative to investor appetites for risk in each asset class. Our approach effectively flips or inverts Markowitz's ROI and denominator while retaining his type of optimization calculation. That is, Markowitz tried to maximize profit from a set of investments constrained by appetite for risk. What our ERM test drive model does is it seeks to maximize the risk reduction that can be produced from a fixed budget. In effect, the goal is to get the best bang for your risk reduction buck. Now you have to keep in mind that ERM is essentially a type of insurance. As such, ERM strategies don't generate bottom line growth or increase profits. This means that ERM typically draws a short straw when competing for scarce resources and budgets, be it in businesses or government agencies. So a portfolio approach that optimizes yield from whatever constrained resources are allocated for ERM is an attractive approach for improving these decisions. So here's a simple way to think about portfolio-based ERMs. This is the core of our test drive. Start with two constructs, threat scenarios, which simply specify the types of threats that are expected to arise, natural disasters like floods and terrorist attacks, and target populations. These are the entities that are impacted by the threat scenarios. A population can be a single thing, an enterprise or society, or an asset, such as a building, computer network, or vessel. More often, it's a set of things, such as the employees of a firm, a fleet of trucks, or all businesses that participate in a market. Now combine these two ingredients to map out a grid. Cells in the grid are called risk exposure segments. Each segment represents one target population vulnerable to one threat scenario. The size of each such cell represents its total risk, which simply equals the amount of risk per individual target times the size of the target population. Note that some populations aren't vulnerable to some threats. For example, buildings inland from a port aren't vulnerable to boat bombs, so grids are often somewhat sparse. So now think of such grids as risk gaming tables. In this model, an ERM decision consists of a bet that places one or more chips on the risk gaming table. Each chip represents an allocation of resources, a capital assets, personnel, and activities that are directed at reducing risk in one segment. Many ERM risk reduction measures combine chips which can then be treated as a single recurring unit for convenience. For example, one airport security line bundles scanning equipment, a team of security officers, and supporting training and maintenance. Viewed through this picture, ERM decision makers face the challenge of identifying high yielding bets, which is to say bets that reduce the most risk. The risk gaming metaphor, while suggestive, is insufficient on its own because it's static. Unlike bets and roulette wheels in, in a casino, roulette wheel spins in a casino, enterprises and societies can't reduce large scale risks in a single instant. Rather, they deploy risk reduction measures over time. Typically, 
This requires preparatory activities, including R&D, building or procuring assets, and hiring and training personnel to operate those assets and processes. ERM resources are then deployed over time to cover populations against threats. These allocations cause risk to decline in those segments incrementally, while the costs to operate and maintain systems and sustain activities accumulate. So an ERM test drive model simulates these risk reduction activities, calculating their accruing benefits, costs, and ultimately ROI. But ERM test drive models are more than just glorified bookkeeping systems. Why? Well, remember that ERM activities occur in environments that are dynamic. Events, trends, and forces manifest while the ERM is being executed. These influences alter threat likelihoods and consequences. In many risk domains, some stakeholders, like terrorists, detect environmental changes, altering their behavior in response. So to recap, Risk reduction is an inherently dynamic process. Bets play out over time, while the cells making up a risk gaming table grow and shrink in size, and sometimes even appear or disappear entirely. ERM test drives animate the playing of ERM games, projecting the performance of risk management decisions as realistically as possible. This picture summarizes the primary inputs and performance metrics for ERM decision test drive models. The details, which I'm not really going to go into much, vary across risk domains based on what data are available about targets and threats, what ERM measures are relevant, and what are the situation-specific dynamics. The most challenging performance metrics to model, realistically, are risk reduction and ROI. For most domains, the risk reduction expected from an ERM measure must be estimated subjectively by subject matter experts, like security analysts. Time precludes discussing this topic, but it deserves its own lecture. You can trust me on that. ROI is the most important and the most challenging performance metric. The most intuitive and naive method for calculating ROI is simply to divide the total risk reduced by total costs. Unfortunately, this value varies depending on exactly when you choose to measure it, and it almost always decreases. The reason is that analysts generally assume that risk decreases immediately and completely upon deploying an ERM measure, whereas costs continue to accrue over time, resulting in steadily decreasing ROI. To model risk dynamics more realistically, we define a metric we call cumulative ROI, which reduces sensitivity to the time of measurement. CROI draws an analogy to dieting. The value of a diet depends not only on how much weight you lose, but how long you manage to keep the weight off. Similarly, our CROI metric gives organizations credit not only for reducing risk, but keeping it reduced. So portfolio strategies get continuing credit for risk reduction while expenditures to keep ERM measures in place continue to accumulate, since risk would otherwise rise again if those measures were withdrawn. We also defined a time efficiency metric to measure the relative speed for deploying ERM strategies. This is important because all other things being equal, it's better to reduce a population's exposure to risk sooner rather than later. Time efficiency provides a crucial metric for tracking and comparing how fast ERM portfolio decisions reduce risk relative to one another. Not surprisingly, ERM performance metrics often conflict. For example, measures that reduce lots of risk may also incur high costs for a, a mediocre ROI, while a strategy that offers superior risk reduction might be slow to do so. So simple judgments of optimality are rarely possible. And commonly, Decision makers must make difficult trade-offs between these metrics. In addition, they must often factor in political considerations. For example, suppose you tighten security procedures in airport screening lines. Well, that's going to tend to slow down the throughput or operational efficiency. And so that's going to anger travelers, airlines, their lobbyists, and politicians. So thus far, I've described test drive models for ERM decisions in broad architectural terms. Now I'll briefly review a specific model that's tailored to manage risk from terrorist threats and then wrap things up. 
My company developed test drive solutions for three client groups within the Department of Homeland Security. Each one's responsible for defending a different national transportation network. So the Coast Guard covers maritime security, protecting the nation's ports, waterways and coasts, water fa waterside facilities and vessels. The Domestic Aviation Division and TSA defends commercial airports and aircraft, while the Highway Motor Carrier Group, or HMC, another unit within TSA, secures our nation's roadways by regulating the fleets of commercial trucks and buses that travel them. Each group collects distinct sets of risk data for their mode and develop their ERM approaches independently. So our test drive models vary in how they define risk exposure segments and project risk reduction, although their metrics and simulation logic are quite similar. Today, I'll focus on the HMC solution. I'll start with a design of the risk gaming table for HMC. All the highway vehicles regulated by TSA can be broken down into four classes, commercial trucks, hazmat, hazardous material trucks, commercial buses, and school buses. We partition them by the fleet size of the companies that own them. Size matters in this case because larger companies tend to have more security resources and tighter policies, which reduces threat likelihoods. So this exercise produced 18 target populations of HMC regulated vehicles with distinct threat properties. Next, HMC analysts identified 13 threat scenarios, essentially terrorist attack modes, grouped into two families. Attack one, uh, the mode one is attackers use a regulated highway vehicle as a weapon against a non-HMC target, such as a, a crowd, building, or piece of critical infrastructure. So you commandeer a bus, for example. Family two, attackers use a VBIED weapon against an HMC vehicle as the target. VBIED simply stands for vehicle-based improvised explosive device, which is a weapon of up to 4,000 pounds TNT equivalent. So mapping these 13 threat scenarios against relevant target populations produces a risk gaming table containing 44 segments. Okay, HMC security analysts defined eight measures for reducing risk from the 13 scenarios. They do multiple duty. Examples include running background checks on vehicle drivers, conducting security training for drivers, and installing remote monitoring and shutoff devices on vehicles. So a risk reduction measure is specified with three ingredients plus something called a fall tree. The deployment schedule simply specifies how many resource units will be rolled out per quarter to cover members of one of those 18 population segments. So we chose calendar quarter as the atomic unit of time, basically the clock tick for the test drive simulations. A cost schedule specifies the estimated cost for deploying and sustaining one resource unit for a reduction measure. Our accounting model employs three buckets to capture the full decision lifecycle costs, one-time capital and startup expenses, labor for operations, and costs for maintenance and repair. It turns out that HMC and the owner operators of the vehicle fleets both shoulder some of these expenses. So this test drive requires two sets of these three buckets. The third spec specifies the reduction in risk anticipated from rolling out one unit of the ERM measure. Risk reduction is estimated in terms of the measure's effectiveness at detecting or interdicting an attack for each relevant threat scenario. So I'm going to go through this real quickly. Uh, fault tree models, uh, terrorist attack is discrete steps in a process. So for example, suppose you want to use a school bus as a weapon. Well, first you've got to acquire the materials and the skills to build the bomb. And you have to buy, rent, or steal a school bus and so on. So each of the security measures I talked about attaches to one of the nodes of the tree and injects its estimated effectiveness at reducing the likelihood of a successful attack. The simulator combines um, all of these piecemeal effects from all the leaf nodes to compute the net reduction in threat likelihood and applies this value to, to compute the risk reduced for the current cycle. The real takeaway here is that fault trees offer a fine-grained causal model 
of where and how security measures act to reduce risk from attacks and how to combine them quantitatively. So this is actually the, the summary representation of an example ERM portfolio decision. Each row basically specifies part of a bet for placing chips on cells in the risk gaming table over time. In 2012, HMC had a budget of roughly $8 million for risk reduction, so program managers wanted to know how far this pot of money would go. To answer this question, we test drove three distinct portfolios to map out a range of outcomes for alternative decisions. This represents an extreme money is no object strategy. It produces the lowest cumulative ROI. So here you apply all relevant risk reduction measures to cover all population segments. Not surprisingly, this is abysmally inefficient. It gives you a CROI of 0 0.004. By contrast, the highest yielding decision produces a CRI of uh, 8.7. So for every dollar you spend, you get roughly nine bucks worth of cumulative risk reduced. This strategy was to apply only the most cost-effective measures to cover only those segments with high risk per population member. However, this decision is politically a non-starter because it ignores segments with the largest populations of vehicles. And this would undoubtedly trigger outrage by stakeholders, including fl fleet owner owners, uh, parents of skilled, uh, school children and legislators. So a third decision crafted a compromise by allocating resources more broadly. Security measures are applied to segments until they hit a threshold. And so what happens is nearly all segments receive some coverage, which is politically a more palatable option. So very briefly, this graph magnifies the left portion of the previous curve. And I show this to highlight how rapidly ROI drops off for counterterrorism spending for HMC. The steepest bend is around $4 million while the curve levels off fully at $20 million. Recall that HMC oversees vast fleets of vehicles, uh, millions of uh, trucks and hundreds, uh, tens of thousands of school buses traveling across enormous networks of roadways. This test drive highlights how difficult it is to reduce risk, much less cost effectively in this domain. So you see here that uh, full coverage is $16 billion whereas a high ROI requires a cumulative cost of only 3.5 million. And note that government's not picking up much of the, the tab uh, all, because H, all HMC does is formulate policies and regulate policies, uh, regulate compliance. So industry is picking up the tab. In TSA, by contrast, they pick, most up, mo pick up most of the enormous cost for commercial airport security. So this is just a, a dual bar chart showing the initial risk and the residual risk after the strategy is applied. And you can see that our measure has reduced risk noticeably in several areas. Uh, these time series charts plot the key performance metrics for our three portfolio strategies over a five-year period. So how much risk is reduced, total cost by counting, uh, counting category, cumulative ROI and time efficiency. The point here is that decision makers will look at these kinds of outputs, ponder them, maybe ask more questions, which generates more test drives, do their comparisons of portfolio decisions, and then perform the trade-offs to make their choice. So let's wrap things up. Uh, decision test drives, as I've sort of plowed through this material, clearly require considerable thought and effort. So the obvious question is why should decision makers subject themselves to this kind of ordeal? And the answer is that competing methods are inherently inferior. So let's take a, a leading alternative, predictive analytics for an example. So predictive analytics extrapolate the likely outcome for a decision at one future instant. So this approach basically reduces the analysis of projected outcomes to studying before and after snapshots. So pr the problem is predictive analytics is too coarse. They offer no visibility into how the elements of a critical decision contribute to desired outcomes, when those benefits will be realized, and how contingencies mid-execution might affect them. In fact, you can't even define comparative metrics that accumulate nonlinear 
like risk reduced, CROI, and time efficiency. So you're completely blind to all this stuff. By contrast, decision test drives generate an entire movie rather than discrete snapshots. And you can edit the original movie script in untold ways using dynamic scenarios, reshoot the movie, and compare outcomes frame by frame if necessary. So test drives thereby produce insights in the dynamics and causality behind executing decisions. And this is critical to reducing exposure to uncertainty and improving outcomes. So to recap, Critical decisions pose high stakes for organizations and careers alike. Improving critical decisions requires bending the law of unintended consequences. To do this, you've got to combat both of its causes, cognitive biases and bounded rationality across the entire decision-making process. And our test drive method uh, leverages best practices, decision modeling templates, and powerful modeling, and modeling simulation techniques to accomplish this task. So the bottom line, test drives essentially enable leaders to practice decisions and learn safely from virtual rather than real mistakes. They help leaders identify decisions that are robust despite rampant uncertainty about the future and other bounds of rationality. And they improve decision outcomes by detecting emerging problems during execution, enabling leaders to make effective mid-course corrections. So uh, this is a view of my book. Uh, a lot of the ideas that I've talked about today are uh, given a kinder, gentler presentation in uh, my blog, which is on the site. Um, there's a complimentary book preview uh, and summary that you can download. And there are two uh, demo videos of two uh, of test drives for two other kinds of decisions. Uh, I've also added two pages of references to the slide deck to provide you with some entries into the relevant literature. Uh, thanks for bearing with me. Thanks very much, Rich. That, that you, You've given us a lot to think about. Um, it, maybe I could just begin with one uh, sort of question. Um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of interest, contemporary interest in uh, a new artifel, artificial intelligence um, program called uh, Chat GPT. Right. Um, I, you know, and as I understand it, it, it what, what it's meant to do is to generate a response to an inquiry based on some uh, amount of training or pre-training. Right. And to transform all of that into a, a, a constructive response. Right. But what I understand, and I have a little bit of personal experience with this, is that it often comes up with responses that are incorrect, um, sometimes totally fabricated. And so I, I wonder whether or not it would have been useful, or I don't, I don't know if it had been done, but I, I wonder whether a process like the one you described would have been useful in advance before chat GPT was introduced into the market. What, what are your thoughts? Maybe this is an unfair question. I mean, it, it's just been introduced, relative, I guess, relatively recently. Yeah. But I, and I may not be susceptible to a short answer, but I'm just curious. Uh, well, <laughs> short answer is it's not susceptible to, <laughs> to, <be able laughs> to a short answer. Yeah. And a guy who really knows this stuff and could actually give an entire lecture on it is uh, Marv, Marv Goldschmidt. He's studying this and he's passionate about what are the implications. Well, he's on the phone here somewhere in the message. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, if we start, we'll never stop that topic. So, uh, but, but yeah, so, I mean, you, you have an enormous amount of data, but r realize that a lot of that data is static, right? It's, it's documents, it's images. Uh, so, yeah. so the power of machine learning in a situation like that is, um, uh, is somewhat limited. I mean, you you could develop an offshoot of that and actually study all that stuff, but you yeah. you would have uh, it would be a tremendous amount of work to do that. And it, and what you would get is you would get an opaque answer. In other words, the chatbot would tell you something, yeah. and you would have no idea what alternatives were would were considered, and you would not. Uh, like I said, this method takes a lot of work. Yeah. One of the benefits of doing the work is you actually develop instincts and intuitions 
about how how situations play out over time. It forces yeah. you know, basically jams your head into the mud of the details of of how this domain works, at least in a model, and it forces you to make a business case for your decision option by saying, you know, every every item that you put into a decision option has to be um, you have to make some assumptions about how you think it's going to work, right? And then play it out. So there's a whole bunch of heavy lifting that Chat GPT can't and never will be able to play at. Well, I just, you know, I guess my bottom line concern is I wonder if it is really something that is constructive and useful in a social sense or whether it's harmful. Well, to, ultimately, to, in a social sense. Mark, maybe you want to jump yeah, in. I, I, let me jump in. I think, you know, the important question is when, if there's a, a critical decision that is being made. Because this is about critical decisions, right. as opposed to ongoing compound errors that hopefully a critical decision might have taken into consideration. The only critical decision that was make, made with GPT was to release it in a blog post on 11:30. In fact, this is unknown. Um, Chat GPT 3.5 has been sitting on the shelf. It's been shelfware for over two years. It was released. It was the company never intended to release it. It was released, as far as I understand, really as a proof of concept for a ten billion dollar investment from Microsoft. And they were working. The whole company was focused on GPT four, uh, which is a dramatically different animal. And uh, that um, so so the only decision here that was a critical decision that had risk associated with it was whether yeah. or not to release it. And that was made from what I understand, purely for a proof of concept to Microsoft and to see what the, what the market reaction would be, but not to accomplish anything specific, like okay. decreasing a risk in a particular area. So I, I think that, you know, there's, there's two questions here. One, could it have come, could Rich's work have come to play in making the decision to release? I think yes, except October, early October, um, Sam Altman made the decision, changed the direction of the company, made the decision to release it on the, at the end of November, and the company went into a six-week crunch to get it done, um, with actually a lot of internal strife, from what I understand. Uh, and so there was no, what's the impact of this? What do we have to do to manage it? It was really a, let's just run an experiment on the world. So that we can satisfy our. You know, I, you know I, I understand that, and I, I just have the feeling that while this may ultimately prove useful, yeah, by what appears to be an early release or an early entry into the marketplace, it may actually be more harmful not not only to the you, you, social you, fabric totally but right. also to the company. But I, I think a critical component, the word critical, in what Rich is talking about, um, is that there is the potential for control. Yeah, you, you always have to, you know, to, to, to be able to manage risk, you have to, yeah. be able to control something yeah. right now. This is this is not this is something that comes up. Well, I was on IBM's data governance council on security and privacy for a decade. Yeah. Um, this is not now an issue of um, a product or a decision. It is now a capability which is generalized. In fact, chat GPT in a way is the most benign way we could have been introduced to it because it is the old thing about the frog in the water. We have been boiling in AI for a while, but we don't realize it, how our credit reports are done, um, how, how people's um, applications for jobs are assessed by ATS systems, whole raft of things. Um, obviously an issue now before the uh, Supreme Court in terms of how people have presented new information. That's all AI that's been subterranean for a long yeah. time. This one is a smack in the face. I see it. I can touch it. And in a way, it's the most benign because it doesn't actually make any decisions as opposed to AI that does make decisions. So the bigger question is, I think, um, is, is at what point during the whole movement towards AI was there the potential for control and any critical decision to unleash it on society? I'm not sure that, that existed for AI. Yeah. AI is a capability like fire. Yeah, you can use it this way. You can use it that way. Sometimes you can contain it. Sometimes it burns down the house. Um, and we don't know yet where that's going. But the issue of control doesn't exist. That's the biggest problem.
you know, there's exactly. a lot of talk about how do we defend ourselves against it, like teachers are using um, a GPT-0 from this kid at Princeton um, to, to assess whether or not a particular a piece of text was produced by chat GPT. Jet, you know, the, the surprise, by the way, at, at OpenAI was they had actually done this before. They released last year, um, early last year, Dolly, which uses exactly the same engine to produce uh, graphics, you know, whether it's a picture of, you know, a baby being held by somebody at a sunset uh, that's photorealistic. By the way, just today uh, became an issue in the EU as to whether or not it violate it's copyrightable and what copyrights it's, it might violate. Um, but the reaction to it was sort of tempered. The reaction to chat GPT was not tempered. So nobody, nobody really expected. So I do think the question of should this be released was a critical decision point that could have been used, but it turned out to be more of an emotional and, and financial decision than a yeah. uh, impactful decision. I, I'd kind of like to get back to part of what your original question was, which yeah. has to do with, you know, what kind of knowledge is in chat GPT as opposed to what kind of knowledge is in one of these models. And the, the knowledge in chat GPT is completely opaque and statistical nature, whereas the knowledge that's embedded and can actually be exposed to users within one of these test drive models is essentially human understandable. Yeah, good point. Instead yeah. of machine learning type AI, it's old school semantic AI. So it's much, it's much closer to what they used to call expert systems and stuff like that. Yeah. You can look at it and poke at it, and it's it, it's in human understandable forms. And that's part of the reason why even if you ran a bunch of test drives and then ran the machine learning algorithm on it, you, you wouldn't get out what a decision maker should get access to, which is the best available knowledge about how you think this world works, how you think counterterrorism works. Uh, uh, we didn't go into today because we didn't have time to go into it, the notion of an adaptive adversary. So in other words, when you have when you're facing a hurricane, if if you put up hurricane shutters and things like that, I, I don't care what hurricane comes at you, wind is wind, right? But when you when you erect defenses against terrorists, you're actually reducing their risk of success. And since they're goal oriented, in other words, they're intentional, they're actually going to change their strategies and their targets and things like that. So part of the reason why counterterrorism is, is, is so difficult is all I showed you was a static plan. Assuming that the terrorists don't do anything else, if we roll right. out these measures, what's yeah. going to happen? Yeah. What you actually have to do is you have to model the adversary, uh, the, what they call the adaptive adversary. You have to do the same thing in competitive marketing strategy, right? Yeah. If I market, a, if I change my marketing campaign for a drug, uh, there are data sources that show people, you know, what the market shares are, and and so every competitor knows the state of the market, and they're not going to sit on their butts, right? They're going to change. So you actually, I said before, the the risk gaming table changes over time. Now the combinatorics of that are ridiculously, you know. Ex exponential and so chat be, machine learning will never get a handle on that yeah you we, we have a couple of hands up so let, let's move on to michael um well i i started taking my hand down after ron you came on uh because i've been sitting here and my heart's been pounding really listening to you richard because <laughs> I, I i thought and think that you, you're on the verge of something huge here if we could use ai uh, in its most basic manner, which, as I understand it, is to evaluate various variables, multiple inputs and outputs, millions of times per second, and whether you could use AI, uh, um, unlike chat and unlike like the drawing programs and those things, but just for its basic function of making 100 million analyses a second on various uh, multiple inputs, multiple outcomes, multiple uh, opportunities to at least reduce the complexity 
of the test drive to produce less options to evaluate. Because I still uh -huh. think that once you get two or more people into a room, you're dealing with the dynamics that you showed in one of your first slides, particularly yeah. the social dynamics, that, well, well am I going to look stupid if I suggest this, or <laughs> am I going to get fired, or et cetera, et cetera. AI can eliminate all of that, as yeah. I understand it. Um, well, you can you can actually use sort of a lower tech lower tech technique that's built into the um, the test drive method. When when you put numbers into the system, there it's instrumented so you can say, well, what's my relative confidence in this information? What's the source of my information? And because a number drops out a whole bunch of information, you can put in your rationale, right? So each model is actually self documented. And so I'll, I'll give you a good example. Let's say you're doing a merger and acquisition, okay? Good example would be when uh, HP took over Compaq, all right? And so the woman who was running HP, Carly Fiorina, put out her own models of what the resulting organization would look like. Walter Hewlett uh, was dead set against it, and he put out his own models, right? And, and and you never saw any of the assumptions that went into these models, and they were basically like apples and oranges. Well, a decision test drive for mergers and acquisitions is like a neutral arbiter. You know, they'd have to put their models into the system, and you could poke at them, and, and there would be no hiding. So all of the biases that we're talking about mm -hmm. are either going to be in full display, or the guy who's who's putting the data in won't dare put them in. So this is this is part of why just because it's this full disclosure process, yeah. it it it, it uh, and it does you know uh, remember confirmation bias. You look at some data and you throw it out if you're not interested. Well, you can't get the model off the ground unless you put in the data that the experts say you need to make a competent decision. So the model is engineered to sort of do some of what you're talking about. It it weeds out a lot of the random stuff or at least it makes it visible such that if you look at the model, you'll throw it out because you say, well, this, this doesn't make sense. Eddie, thank you. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm <laughs> to be honest, I've got about a zillion questions, but uh, I know from my own experience many years ago uh, where we were, we produced a decision product and what we used to test for was robustness of decisions. Uh, using graphical interfaces to help convince people that they were on the right kind of path. In fact, what, what you're doing sort of reminds me very much of that. The other thing, though, that, that uh, uh, intrigues me is that um, I spent quite a number of years at EMC, and one of the big problems we had was data collection. Um, to be able to validate uh, often some of the models that I was producing. It often took me two to three years to put the data collection in place uh -huh. um, and that kind of thing. So um, sometimes you, you're just faced with this fact of, of, of time uh, and pre-planning. Uh, I was lucky I managed to pre-plan and managed to get my models in such a condition that I could predict when people were going off the rails with it. Um, but uh, so I guess one of the things, I, do you find it difficult actually at times to, to really have the data available to be able to make your models work? Well, that's, uh, I, I look at it, it's a great question. I look at it a different way. Uh, the way we build these models is actually very pragmatic. Like when I started out, I didn't know anything about counterterrorism. So I worked with either uh, system integrator partners and we worked in conjunction with the agency. The whole idea of building a model is brutally pragmatic. In other words, we don't, we don't deal with data that you can't collect or data that's uncertain. What we do is we do an assay and try and figure out what is the available data that the anticipated user is going to be able to get their hands on and how do i represent it and then we build the model from there so a lot of the things that you find problematic we would just say well if people can't do that there's no point in building a model that presupposes that so we sort of screen that out on a pragmatic yeah. basis 
we, we used to do it with subject matter experts to yeah that that's what we did the bounds essentially of of the, of the data range yeah um and then play with monte carlos if we had to yeah um, and we we do that too we have uh basically we have a toolkit of simulation techniques because no one technique fits all right so we have uh system dynamics monte carlo process models uh game theory uh, something called real options. Uh, uh, we haven't built it, but we know how to design it. Uh, Bayesian inference, things of that sort. So it's it's okay. sort of uh, uh, in a given domain, what are the do dominant dynamics? What are the best tools to model those dynamics? And how do I mix them together? Which is a problem that most uh, unimodal simulators, like like just a Monte Carlo tool, they don't have a provision for doing that because their worldview is, uh, you know, it's my way, the highway. I, I mean, simulationists yeah. are kind of like jihadists, right? <laughs> Mine is the I, I, path. Yeah, you know, I've come across that too. <laughs> following on your response, Jim, uh, Rich, just a question. I mean, all of this depends on having access to data that you feel is trustworthy. So, so how do you how do you collect and curate and verify that you're you've got authentic data that's useful? How how do we do that? I mean, that's not a unique problem yeah. for the enterprise that you're talking about. But anyone who is using a database has to curate that data. They have to make sure it's authentic and reliable. How do we do yeah. that? That's well, what 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 I did going to market was uh, I hit upon a. A, a division of labor for various reasons that we won't go into. But basically, I went to market with uh, essentially a management consultant or system integrator. And my sweet spot is building these building these tools and these models, right? Oh, so yeah. going in and figure out what's a Goldilocks model. Yeah, it can't be too detailed and it can't be too coarse, and it has to be something that adds value to the decision maker. That's what I bring to the table. My partner, on the other hand. Their job in the food chain is to collect the data, curate and validate the data, yeah. work with the client to do what ifs. So there's a division of labor. And I, I tried not to deal with that problem <laughs> because it wasn't it didn't play to my strengths and I couldn't scale it as a small outfit. Yeah, I got you. But there is someone in the food chain and that's their business and they love to do it. And because um, because once you're done with a critical decision, once you've actually made the decision, you have to execute it. And you have to use this early system warning mode, early system warning mode. Uh, there's an annuity revenue stream for the consulting partner because they have to keep coming back yeah. and, and checking. So on, on paper, that kind of model made a lot of sense. You know, I, I have to say, Rich, my overwhelming thought is that we need to have you come back <laughs> after. I, I want to just point out that we, we recorded this session, uh -huh. and the very last slide shows. Uh, the book that Rich uh, published, and I think if I, I have the feeling there are people among our group who are interest, very interested in this, you ought to get a copy of that book. And after we've had a chance to think a little harder, because uh, you've given us a lot of stuff to think about, Rich. Yeah, you ought to come back and allow us to sort of quiz you on some of our understanding sure. or lack of understanding of what we read. Right. Well, what what I recommend is is first. Uh... The, the book is pretty wonky, so it's 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 readable, but it's dense. I mean, in the spirit of full disclosure, that's so, an honest appraisal from the author. Then. Okay. So, well, I'm trying to protect it. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so the the first thing to do would be to look at the blog, where most of the central themes that I talked about today and a few other yeah. things, yeah. they're in a kinder, gentler, two to four page format. Okay. So people can look at that stuff. Or look at the uh, the preview, yeah. which is essentially the introduction in the first chapter, uh, without getting hammered. Okay, and then make, make a decision. <laughs> Fair and enough. And then the book itself, in the preface, uh, it has what I call an express route, which is <laughs> rather than going through all the detail, yeah. there's a there's a relatively quick and dirty and survivable way to go right. through, uh, and you know, to go through the high points of the book. But I'd be yeah. happy to come back and, um, I mean, if if you put some, uh, we Question. could talk about a particular set of topics to prepare yeah. for 
Otherwise, yeah. it could be a free for all. I don't care. No, no, I agree. I and I think that that's a reasonable approach. Thank you. Dan Metley's hand up, and Dan, you're you're going to have the final question this morning. We're <laughs> reaching the end of our hour, so go ahead, Dan. Well, as as sort of the resident social scientist in this group, uh, I I liked your sort of summary of of the uh, Tversky and Kahneman and the, the the Herbert Simon at all kind of bounded rea uh, rationality. Yeah. Uh, I, I do have a, a little quibble. I'm not sure the two things are different because as I look at bounded rationality, I think a major a major aspect of that is in fact the the sort of biases and the psychological stuff that uh, Tversky and Kahneman and their followers have introduced. And I think I'm just wondering, how does one change one's argument if one sees them separately? Well, his historic, I mean, this is, I, I tried to get this uh, across, but it um, wasn't enough time. I mean, the real hero of the story, and my book is an homage to this guy, is, is Merton, Robert yeah. K. Merton, who sure. basically invented uh, the sociology of science with his doctoral thesis. And his paper that introduced the law of unintended consequences was a separate thing that he wrote when he was a graduate student at Harvard, of all things, to provide a framework for the empirical thesis that he did. But the, the problem was he was a graduate student. He published it in sociology and it got lost, it got lost right. in the literature. But he's the one who saw the big picture. He's the one who actually saw it the way you see it, which is there's this spectrum of interacting messy things. But if you look at the literature today, if you look at books on decision making mm. and you look at what uh, the, the lead consultants who deal with cognitive biases are some guys at McKinsey. So in the references, uh, there's a guy named Lavallo and a, a academic that works with McKinsey called Saboni, I think his name is. And they talk about cognitive biases. So if you look at the I'm, I'm merely reporting what's out there yeah. so you talk to people who think about decision making. And they've they've bifurcated into two camps. They've they've come up with more rigorous scientific accounts of the factors that Merton put together, but but they're 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 polar opposites, right? They're they're you you're either in the bias camp or you're in the bounded rationality camp. And if you look at their literature, if you look at Tversky and Kahneman and Simon. They rarely they rarely acknowledge or talk about one another. Well, and, know who and each other are, and it's it's even more complicated than that. My my older son just got his PhD uh, just a decade ago, got his PhD <laughs> uh, in the history of science department at Harvard, and of course their their emphasis, and he right. told this to me quite explicitly, that Merton is not taken seriously anymore. Something I disagree with, but but the fact is that most of the work that's none now done uh, in STS yeah. uh, rarely acknowledges Merton um, and and assumes that there is no separation between these cognitive biases and bounded rationality. Anyway, just a thought. <laughs> yeah, well, it's true. I actually um, I corresponded with uh, Merton's uh, second wife, who's a sociologist of science in her own right, and uh, she curates the Merton papers at Columbia University. So they've gotten a copy of my book and they've put it in the library on the shelf of uh, inspired by Merton. But but it's true the uh, the field has gone into a much more relativistic. There's no one truth objective analysis of the matter kind of mode and Merton's been left by the wayside but um, he is so timely for today he's a brilliant guy well I I tried to convince my son of that point of view and I must <laughs> say I was terribly unsuccessful well, that's a that's a pity that's kids for you. <laughs> that shows cognitive bias. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rich, I want to, I want to, I want to thank you on behalf of all of us for a really thought-provoking conversation today. 
Uh, and I do want to, as always, thank the, the folks who have participated in the Q&A following. This, is, this has been a really good session. I enjoyed this enormously. So we, we will meet again in two weeks. Um, we'll have a speaker from MIT's Urban Studies Program. And he's going to talk about citizen activism as it is related to technological issues. I think you'll find it very interesting. So his name is David Hugh, uh, Sue, HSU. He's from uh, Urban Studies at MIT. So thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. Rich, again, thank you very much for oh, joining you're us. You're very welcome. Thanks for thank inviting me. Thank you very me. much. Thanks. Take care, folks. Bye-bye. Clean this session yet. Thanks, John Brown. Thanks, Rich.